Welcome, everyone. Welcome to this uh, Market Thursday. We are December the 2nd. It's 8 p.m. here in London. So welcome to you tonight. And welcome of you if you're joining later on YouTube. Um, as a quick disclaimer, uh, this webinar is not for invest is not investment advice. So this is purely for information. Uh, I do not take responsibility for losses incurred by the viewers. Uh, so please do your own research before doing anything. Uh, quickly, uh, just um, going through my CV. Um, so I started in 2000 in Paris as a cash equity trader. I worked in Paris for four years, um, on mostly on the long only product. In 2004, I arrived in London, worked for a hedge fund on the long only product and on the long short product, uh, where uh, we were managing between uh, half a billion to three quarters of a billion on the Western European part. And uh, the overall company was managing between two to three billion. Um, then from 2009, uh, I started to work as a prop trader uh, at Infinity Capital Markets, uh, where I had an absolute return mandate with no assets and region constraints. So all was about making money. Um, since 2014, I've been mentoring uh, retail traders from all over the world. Uh, now, I've, I think I've done more than 100 uh, over the last seven years. Uh, I was previously working for another education company that I left in 2017. I stopped trading at the end of um, 2017, start of 2018. I was pretty tired. Um, and um, I launched my mentoring program after uh, some people asked me. Uh, to get mentored by me. Then I launched the 4x4 video series uh, in 2019. And at the start of, of, of this year, uh, we started uh, at Infinity uh, doing some uh, prop trading. And in the meantime, doing some, um, still doing mentoring and uh, have some other projects coming in the pipeline. So today, what we're going to be covering uh, situation across asset classes. So it's going to be a very busy day, a uh, very busy session. We're going to have a lot to cover. Uh, so the market has been quite volatile across asset classes. We're going to be talking about the Fed, the volatility, the bond market. So there's a bit of, of everything in the same basket. Um, sorry if it's not like, uh, you know, uh, German style, but um, I try to, uh, to share as many ideas and things that I've seen over the last couple of weeks or the last month. Um, we're gonna be talking about the purchasing manager index uh, from the US, uh, from the rest of the world, and talking a bit about the oil market that we covered um, uh, more in details uh, in, in September. Uh, so as always, what I'd like to start with is uh, discussing the, um, the catalyst going forward. Uh, so tomorrow we get um, the NFP, so we got the unemployment. Um, so the Fed is looking at it, everyone is looking at it, but uh, it seems like a done deal that uh, the Fed will have to, to taper. Uh, so it's coming. Um, what is important now is what's going to happen in the Q1, Q2 uh, in terms of tapering and potentially in terms of uh, the, the, the central banks, the Fed uh, hiking uh, rates. Um, so uh, as we are now in the middle of uh, 15th uh, um, <laughs> waves of, of COVID with the, um, this one coming from South Africa, everything um, is on, um, on hold. Uh, in terms of timing, not easy uh, as portfolio manager. Um, so last uh, uh, Friday, as you remember, a couple of weeks ago, <laughs> I told you <laughs> Uh, that normally Thanksgiving is very quiet and actually you could go away and not do much. And actually last Friday, guess what? Uh, it was the most um, volatile day of the week, uh, which means that uh, you, with the beauty of the market, you never know when, when something is going to happen. Uh, so the news uh, came out um, at, I think it was uh, 10 something, nine uh, UK time last Thursday that uh, that South Africa uh, was recording this new uh, variant. Uh, so the, the futures open at uh, 4,700 on the S&P at 11 uh, p.m. And then, you know, sell off, sell off um, and, and carry on the, the, the whole day. Uh, what we have in the U.S. for Thanksgiving, it's a half session uh, where normally most U.S. Uh, investors will be with their families or just, you know, recovering for having um, too much food and too much uh, 
wine on the day before and but the market really uh, sold off um, that um, and as we're going to see uh, that was across uh, asset classes uh, so catalyst going forward we are still waiting for for the results of this um, of this variant and and how the vaccines could be effective against them um, the downside is it takes at least uh, 10 to two to weeks. I, I, here I'm not pretending by any means that I'm a, a COVID specialist and I don't want to go into that direction. The only thing that matters in terms of timing for us uh, in a couple of weeks, we get the Fed on, on, on the Wednesday and the two days later, we get the, um, the OPEX, the uh, option expiry. So that means normally um, on that Friday in two weeks, many investors will be reducing their exposure, reducing their book, uh, because, you know, after that, the, 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 the year is pretty, is pretty quiet and, and, and you, go, uh, you go on vacation. Uh, so that means um, uh, we have a lot of, a, a lot of uncertainties before uh, now in these next two weeks. And, and the, the, probably the outcome of this, of this vaccine against um, against this new form of COVID will will come uh, at the same time that we get the Fed and we get the, the OPEC. So um, uh, potentially a binary outcome. Um, as I told you before, I was short the S&P. I was short the S&P from this uh, 4530, 4550. We went to 4750. Um, so I closed that short of with uh, pretty much flattish. Uh, I was pretty lucky because I had, I had futures and I had options. So uh, the spike in the VIX um, with my put options made me uh, made, make a bit of money. But literally, um, that was um, uh, the risk reward um, was not really, really great. Uh, we're going to be talking later about this oil trade that had been working very, very well. Um, and again, uh, we're going to be uh, talking about this different subject. Uh, as always, starting with the asset classes uh, performances year to date. Um, so the picture is, is on the left hand side is more or less the same, even if we go there, we went down uh, three to five percent from, from the all time high. So if you look at the SP, uh, we are as of yesterday at 20 percent on the year, um, we were up to 25 percent. But for the developed market uh, equities, uh, stocks, uh, the performance here to date is, is pretty strong. Um, the dollar has been, uh, so that's here, the dollar has been pretty strong uh, over the last three to six months. Um, Bitcoin has been coming down. Uh, more interestingly, this one, uh, WTI, uh, where everyone wanted you to be bull, bull, bull uh, in September, and it was up uh, more than 50% actually is only up 35%, which is still significant, but it has been coming uh, quite a lot. So um, that is the picture on the year to date. Um, on a week to date, uh, and that will have been from, from last uh, Wednesday uh, to uh, yesterday, which was Wednesday, that is the overall picture where we see uh, stocks are on average uh, down three to 5%. Um, what is interesting is the Russell, the small, uh, caps in the US have been underperforming uh, massively the overall market, which can be explained by the, the, the poor liquidity, as we're going to be uh, um, uh, looking at later. But as well, uh, you have some, some crappy names um, in, in, the, uh, in the Russell 2000. Uh, more interestingly, uh, as we're going to see, uh, the market, uh, the internals, we have been discussing that over and over. You had many, many names that have been suffering over the last six to eight, eight weeks, uh, coming down between 20 and 70%. And, and, and the market was, again, driven by very few names, Apple, NVIDIA, um, very AMD, um, which, which um, based on the weightings, helped the overall market. But, but the market breadth, meaning the, the winners versus the losers, very few winners uh, versus a lot of, of losers. Um, Currencies, there has been a bit of, of, of fly to, uh, to safety with going for, for, for the US dollar and WTI massively down again uh, last Friday um, as there was a um, uh, sell off based on, on very uh, small liquidity and probably some market dealers uh, chasing the gamma and uh, uh, 
And so you have uh, uh, um, market dealers that have to, to sell the futures, chasing the futures, and, and, and keep on selling the futures. Um, on the, on the different uh, sectors, the 11 sectors of the S&P plus the S&P, uh, energy is still very much up 44% uh, on the year, which is pretty impressive. But if you look at the November sector performance, uh, you can see that really uh, technology, uh, which was almost up 5%, was uh, the outlier, uh, the outperformer. Um, and the rest of the market was pretty much done. Um, telco down 6%, which is a lot. Financials down 6%. Um, so a lot of, of bonds related um, was suffering. Some defensive did okay. Um, next into the next slide. Uh, so this is the slide that I, I like uh, looking at um, the VIX, uh, which, is not a, which is not an asset, but... Um, is always important for us to understand uh, where is the volatility. So again, I'm repeating myself. Since its creation, the, the VIX is at 19%. Um, as of yesterday, the close was at 31%. Most of, um, of, of this year, we have been trading around 19%, uh, 18%. So we had a spike, a massive spike, as you can say. Uh, see, 31% is, is, is really the high of the year. Uh, and coming uh, very quickly uh, on Friday. So last Friday, I think it was one of the top five moves in the, in the VIX. Um, don't look at the VIX on, um, as, um, as a percentage gain because it's, it's, um, it's implied volatility, meaning, meaning it's, it, it's already a percentage. So each time I see someone saying the VIX is up 45%, that doesn't, that doesn't make any sense at all. Uh, for the bonds, um, there has been a kind of uh, flight to safety. Uh, so the, uh, uh, the, the 10 years went from the 160 to 140, roughly. So uh, bonds um, up, um, which again, flight to safety uh, and probably as well, uh, market participants not expecting uh, such a, a strong recovery. That doesn't mean that uh, market participants are not expecting inflation, but um, uh, um, as we're going to see, the, the flattening of the yield curve uh, means probably um, uh, uh, that the Fed is going to be active next year, but then uh, we're not going to have a very uh, uh, that strong economy. Top winners, top losers, uh, as always, um, some funny names or some uh, a lot of biotech names on the way up, on the way down. Um, similar to, um, to what we do, um, looking at the asset classes in, in November, again, technology, the big winner. On the, at the other end of the spectrum, uh, commodities and oil, uh, um, really the laggards and making the, the, the bottom of this, um, of this table. Very interesting, again, in September, everyone hold the headlines, 80% uh, of the tweets where, you know, you should go long commodities, you should go long oil. Um, so the whole space is, is, is down uh, massively um, from, from September. So there has been a lot of pain. So if you look at this picture between energy financials down 5% um, and technology that is up, there has been a lot of pain in this market. So if we take a step back, uh, we knew that, um, uh, that in, in September and more importantly, I think it was in October, um, there was some false signals from, from central bankers, uh, meaning that the bond market, the money market traders and portfolio managers suffered quite a lot. So um, we went up, we went down, uh, but the moves were quite extreme, um, uh, whereas the equity market was pretty quiet versus the, the, the noise and the volatility that we had in the bond market. So there has been a lot of suffering first in, 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 this, um, in this space, uh, uh, a, a pickup as well in the volatility of, um, of um, FX, of, um, of uh, currencies uh, that we've seen. And uh, Euro dollar was not really moving. Then suddenly it started, the dollar started to get a bit stronger. So volatility that spread as well into FX, a lot of volatility as well coming into commodities. And then the last part of the, of the puzzle, which was equities. So in other words, over the last couple of months um, and, and before uh, last Friday sell-off, 
despite the market making new all uh, new all time highs um, if you consider that your equity allocation for big investors could be 30 50 60 70 percent but not 100 percent that means a lot of exposure that they have in the, the that they have in their portfolio was experiencing some some real damage some real volatility and my view is always the same if part of those portfolios are struggling you know that at one stage those same investors will have to reduce exposure somewhere so um, that means if you're carrying a big gross exposure when those things start to uh, to happen you know that you're going to be in trouble even if the vix was you know below the 20 percent always be uh, uh, listening to what happened to the other asset classes because quickly it could spread to to your uh, core positioning um, that might be uh, stocks. So here, this is the same picture. We, if we look at industries, um, most of the industries, we are talking, you know, uh, 80 to 90% of the industries in, in November uh, were down. Um, only uh, semiconductors on the back of NVIDIA, AMD, um, were pretty strong, same with technology, but um, on the other end of the spectrum, uh, oil services, casinos, uh, solar airlines. So a lot of as well um, uh, reopening stories get absolutely murdered. Um, so really a lot of pain on, on, on names that actually, again, as I've been saying, were pretty hot. Uh, so you had a lot of uh, five to let's say 30 billion market cap, which have been absolutely destroyed over the last four to eight weeks. Uh, so we are talking UPST, we are talking uh, DKNG, we are talking many, many names that have been suffering uh, big time or the meme stocks um, as well. Um, and actually very, very few names have been holding uh, well. Commodities, I think this is interesting uh, again. Um, you can see that uh, uh, the um, everything that is uh, uh, gasoline, oil, natural gas, literally destroyed in November. There has been uh, 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 no prisoner. Uh, it has been a one-way traffic, so uh, very painful for a lot of investors. Um, I strongly advise you to do that for looking at the performances. Uh, my mentees know that this is something that I was trying to push looking on the weekly, monthly, quarterly, what has been doing pretty well. You start with the index, then the sector, then the industries, and that tells you a lot about, you know, the story about what is happening in the market. And you can as well, uh, more importantly, try to spot what are the, uh, the new um, uh, uh, winners um, the new versus the, the laggards. So really what we try to identify as investors you know, is what could outperform the market or what could underperform the market. So looking at those trends is, is, is always uh, helpful. So volatility spike here I'm using uh, for one. Uh, normally I do the, uh, the VIX, which is for the S&P here. I'm using the V2X, which is for the, the euro stocks. Um, and where the picture is more or less the same, where you can see the spike that happened last, last uh, since last Friday. Uh, so the, um, uh, literally we went from, from a, a year that was pretty boring, uh, where we had some uh, every three months, a bit of a spike, but, and those spikes, most of the time were happening as you know already now, uh, when we had the expiries or also um, along those expiries, we got a spike in volatility. But this one was, was a proper move. So um, this is for the Euro stocks. Uh, this is for Europe. Um, and uh, if you look at this volatility spike, uh, this is something that we explain uh, in the four by four video series. So for those of you who have done the four by four, you know that already is trying to understand what is the, the VIX um, uh, translation in terms of move of the S&P. So if we take the VIX um, at 30%, um, roughly where it was yesterday, and the S&P at uh, 45, 30, uh, which is roughly what it, where, where it was yesterday. Um, if, you uh, if you take the odds, uh, you're gonna have a 68% uh, percent chance that roughly you're gonna have a 1.9% move. So when the VIX is at 32, and that's the rule of 16 times two, 
that gives you a 2% move on the S&P. So um, we could expect, we should expect the S&P when the VIX is at 30%, roughly 32%, to be moving by 2% on the day. Um, and if you want to take a 95% uh, chance or a two, two standard deviation, we are talking a 3.8 move. So always helpful instead of overthinking and looking at the VIX and think, oh, the, the VIX is at 20, so the S&P has got a chance. I think the VIX is going to be moving by 5%. You just do your calculation and say, no, the market, you know, with a VIX at 30% means that probably we might be moving by uh, 2%. Let's uh, move into uh, technical analysis uh, quickly up. Uh, so here, this is for Apple versus the SPY. Um, so I was just checking before the call uh, how uh, Apple has been doing versus the S&P. So recently there has been a, a spike in the performance of, of Apple. Um, as you know, if you've been following me, um, it's mostly a question of, of those weekly calls or those short-term calls. Uh, I tweeted a couple of days ago, uh, so they, you had a ton. Um, on Monday, a lot of 165 call, then a, a, a ton of 170 call, and guess what? The, the, the stock went to 170.30, then you have the sell-off and, and, and this, this thing follow up. So um, for all those big names, for those leaders, um, where the way people are, are, are playing those um, those names and more importantly, how retail traders have been playing those names since uh, um, I think 2019, mostly why? Because it, it, it is now almost free for those guys to be playing with options. Uh, they will be doing playing the, the weekly option. So when you're looking at those leaders, please uh, make, just make the exercise from time to time to look at what are the, uh, the weekly options, the strikes, where are the open interest, where are the volumes, because literally that helps a lot. Um, if you want to uh, uh, play it, if you want to trade it, uh, literally, you know, uh, on Monday, I didn't touch, um, on Tuesday, I didn't touch uh, uh, Apple uh, before it reaches this 165 or this 170. Um, so um, we're going to start with stocks, some, some, some funny names. I don't know if it's funny because maybe some of you are just, you know, dying with those names. So that's from Upstart. Um, why I'm taking up start because the stock was was IPO'd in, in 2021, but uh, literally this is one of those names that were uh, pushed um, massively. So three three months ago, everyone was doing the same screening, which is all the screening were based on the top line, on sales, on revenue growth. So uh, people were doing uh, revenue growth over the last two to three years and the next two to three years. And anything that was showing, let's say, 30% plus on the CAG, on, 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 on compounded um, annual growth, that uh, will show and everyone was long those names. Uh, and uh, those names since the peak, since September, October, most of them have been destroyed. So UPST, um, so there is a gap here at 141. I don't know if it's going to close, but uh, literally uh, expect uh, the worst case scenario, which is, you know, the move to be uh, much more than, than, than what you have normally. Um, MasterCard uh, and Visa, uh, something that we discussed a couple of weeks ago, uh, pretty weakish. Uh, so we get this head on shoulder. I think it's it's you're gonna have um, probably another ten dollars before it reaches an interesting uh, level. Uh, looking at the uh, the visa versus the spy, actually you can see how uh, visa has been uh, weak versus the overall market. So you can argue again that the S and P is is made of uh, very few names now. But um, if you have someone telling you in a very smart way on CNBC, I've been long Visa because Visa is a very good name and it's outperforming the market, that is just not true. Okay, over the last two to three years, four years, Visa has not been outperforming the market. Uh, I think there is a good case with crypto and uh, the blockchains for, for those businesses to be in danger. I've been telling that over, over and over. I'm repeating myself. Uh, always looking at the market leaders, and when I say the market leaders is, you know, what are the, the biggest companies? So looking at JP Morgan, JP Morgan, interestingly, uh, we are back to the level um, on the, just after the Q1 release. So the 160, 161, um, 
the chart doesn't look that great. Interestingly, they are supposed to have a massive share buyback and the stock is, is not doing great. Uh, NVIDIA, uh, so NVIDIA here, I'm gonna be switching from, so this is your daily chart. Uh, when it's consolidating, the way it has been recently, you could switch into an hourly chart um, if you are more into levels. So, you know, on the support, we, got, we are talking 309. Resistance is probably 335. So this is the, the consolidation phase that we have now on, on NVIDIA. Uh, another name that I've been discussing in the, um, on the community, uh, which is um, KD. Uh, let me go back in the, here, this is Kindrill. Uh, so this name is the spin-off of, um, of IBM. I've been doing a bit of fundamental. I've been struggling to, when you have a, a spin-off, it's always hard to, I mean, the, the, you can do the valuation, but you never know obviously when it's going to stop, uh, especially when there is a, a, a sell-off on those names because of, you have for sellers, people that don't want to hold these names because they just want to hold IBM. Um, but you, you try to find a positive catalyst. I think there was a catalyst a couple of weeks ago, a couple of days ago when the management bought some shares. Um, just for the record, I initiated a position. I'm not saying that you should do anything, uh, but that's something that I try to push on the community and try to push with the four by four, which is special situation and sp spin-off is very interesting. And I think there's going to be a tons of spin-off um, in, in the next uh, two years. S&P, uh, going back to uh, the big, um, the big S&P. Um, so I've been telling you from 45, 30, uh, 45, uh, 50 that I, I started to go short. Uh, so I increased the short, uh, as I told you, bought some put. I've been pretty lucky now. Uh, as I said, I, I bought back. I have, uh, I, the outcome is pretty unclear. So it's very binary. You can uh, argue on one hand, you know, what about the Christmas rally? And on the other hand, you know, the world is slowing the COVID. If you get bad news on COVID, you go uh, much lower. Um, it's almost the, the, uh, the end of the year. Um, I don't like to play binary. Uh, so uh, you can argue that um, uh, being in the money, you should keep the position. Um, I'm probably not good enough here, yeah. uh, but uh, technically same as with the, uh, the uh, NASDAQ. Um, I mean, the NASDAQ, uh, we, we probably need to recover this, this level of, of the, the 15, uh, 400, um, other, other than that, you know, you get the, the 50 days moving average, but clearly there has been a deterioration. It's even more true with the, uh, as I said before, with the Russell 2000. Um, so the way technical analysts uh, will do things is when, it's, when there is a move up, they will tell you that there is a breakout. And when it comes back down, uh, it's, it's a bull trap. Okay, so probably what you have here is a bull trap, but as you can see, uh, the the breakout was not done on, on very significant volume. Um, so it's a bit of uh, looking at uh, the story after it happened, but um, for a good combination on a breakout, you, you want to see a, a, a real pickup in, in volume. Um, so you can do that. Uh, probably on the weekly chart, uh, using a weekly chart log. Um, but what it tells you is the, um, the support on this one is, is probably 5% below. As I said before, a lot of crappy names on the Russell 2000 have been absolutely destroyed. Uh, so um, this is why it, it underperformed the, the overall uh, market. Finally, uh, sem semiconductor, because this is a clear uh, leader in the market. Uh, it is still consolidating. So it, it is very much like NVIDIA, very much like AMD. Uh, that you have many names that are the same. For the time being, the, uh, it's consolidation. So that doesn't mean that um, uh, it, it, the technicals are, um, are that bad. Um, we need a bit of a breather here. Uh, but if that's a market uh, leader and, and pushing the market higher, uh, this is still the one uh, I, I will say uh, to follow. Um, next one is the uh, crude oil, uh, because as you know, I've been pushing for short crude um, since the uh, 82, 85. 
So that has been a very uh, successful trade. Uh, once every 15 years, it's good to have a good trade. Um, and this one was a really, really good trade. Um, so um, I've been saying uh, on the community today, uh, when it was trading below 65, that's probably uh, if you were short or if, if you have been uh, shorting uh, this one, uh, buying uh, back your sh your um, your short between 64 and 65 was a good idea. Why I'm saying that? Because I think now a lot of um, is priced in. Uh, and more importantly, OPEC said, you know, it's an open meeting. So if the situation deteriorates a bit more, we're going to be cutting production. So they said that for January, they will still increase production by 400 barrels, 400,000 barrels, uh, but it could change pretty quickly. Uh, at the end of this uh, uh, um, session, we're going to be discussing oil uh, more in, de in detail. But I think, you know, the downside is, you know, uh, probably 62, but uh, around 65, uh, buying back your your um, your short, at least my short, uh, was a, a good idea. Euro dollar, euro dollar. Um, so looking at this chart, I mean, I've been saying, uh, doing the same chart over and over, so you know it. So we went actually bang on the support here. I thought that we will stop into the 112.50, but you know, we only went down a, a bit more. To me, uh, that's the euro dollar. I think the uh, the downside of the euro for me is is, is pretty limited. Um, so uh, I, I can read uh, tons of people saying, you know, the dollar is going to be king again, strong, strong, strong. The same one that were telling us six months ago that the dollar was really uh, a piece of shit. Uh, sorry for my English, but um, I think um, if you had Again, a position here that is the time uh, to close. Um, another one uh, in terms of currency. So we go from one extreme to the other, the Turkish Lira. So Turkish Lira, we have been uh, discussing that on the uh, community since nine as a short. Uh, so one of the, the members pushed uh, this idea, been working very well. Uh, looking at this move, I think, and it's not that I think, Turkey will have to do something. I don't know what they can do. Uh, it's just that the move is, is now not unreal, but uh, very extended. Uh, that doesn't mean that we should go against it or, or we should be trading it, but there is a lot of, it's too much. Uh, so something we'll have to give. I don't know what, I'm not smart enough, but uh, be careful if you have positions and make sure that uh, you do uh, um, um, a size that is, uh, manageable. Let's go back into our, yes, our slides. So VIX, we talk about the volatility spikes. Uh, let's discuss now the market internals. Uh, market internals is about uh, understanding what has been, uh, how the market has been behaving. Um, I'm a big fan of market internals um, because that tells you a lot about the, what's going on in the market, the music of the market, what is moving. So this one, I found it on, on Twitter, and I think this is this is interesting, where uh, the, the first column is about the, the year-to-date return of the S&P, uh, the Nasdaq, and the Russell, you know, between 14 to 24 percent. Um, uh, but more interestingly, you can see here that the average member drawdown from year-to-date is minus 19 percent um, from, from the, uh, for the S&P. So, in other words, the when it was done, that was on the 29th, the market was, you know, probably 2% from the total time high. Uh, but in the meantime, you get many, many names. You get 92% of the names that were done 10% from their recent high. So um, that is something uh, as well that was explained from, from Sogen uh, uh, today. Uh, that was more for, for, for the Russell when we had the sell-off from the Russell. Um, but literally, the... the, the in terms of liquidity uh, in the sell-off that we had last Friday, uh, the liquidity of the S&P futures and the, the Nasdaq E was not great, but okay. But for the Russell, it was it, it was pretty 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 bad. So, um, in other words, what we have is a market that is uh, where you get ten percent of the constituents that are leaders are behaving pretty well. 
And 80 to 90% of the names that will be acting very poorly. So um, if you look at the market breadth, which is looking again at the stocks that are going up versus the stocks that are going down, very often you, we had days this year where the market was up 1% and actually probably two thirds of the stocks were down on the day. What is very hard when we look for me as a, as a trader or, or portfolio manager is when I look at this market breadth and, and those internals, I know that the market is driven by very few names. And you can argue that over time, um, um, that, that is true. So if you look over the last hundred years, uh, very often the performance of the indexes will be made by very, very few names. Why? Because, you know, if you get a co good company, this company will get bigger and that will be uh, driving um, uh, the overall market. But um, literally over the last three months, we had a market that was again driven by very few names and you start to see uh, uh, dispersion, di divergence between the winners and the losers. So you get part of the market that get absolutely murdered since September. Uh, we've seen UPST, but that was some of the names. And overall, the market was, was do, doing uh, uh, pretty much okay. So it's like if you take 20% of those stocks, they will be green and 80% will be red. So what is hard is it's almost impossible to time when it's going to reverse. And, and you know, to argue that you, uh, that you go short this market and you're just lucky because, you know, you get unlucky uh, because you get the COVID news. Um, that is that is not enough but um, what you have is is those market internals so here i take um, um this is something that i've been working recently um so these those are roughly the 30 big weights of the s p okay so here this is the weights of the s p with apple microsoft and i looked at the performance over the last month so as you can see uh, over the last month the market was flattish or small down um, and you get names like Apple, like Amazon that were up, Tesla were up, uh, and some of the names get absolutely murdered. So literally, again, uh, th this market is uh, where 20-30% of the, the cumulative weight will be making most of the performance of the index. So this is what we call the market internal. So same same thing if you look as of yesterday uh, something that i did this morning uh, before the, the us open um if you look at the s p at the close um they have 505 constituents it was done almost five percent from its all-time high the number of stocks that were done more than 50 percent you get six more than 30 percent you get 43 more than 20 percent 129 more than 10 percent 316 so you get 60% of the stocks that were done more than 10% when in the meantime, the market was only done by 5%. And only 51 stocks or 10% of the constituents were done less than 5% from their all-time highs. So again, hard to, hard to time, but in other words, that in other words, that tells you that the market is not that healthy. It's not like everything is going up, uh, which you can argue that this is a really good thing because normally if you're good with alpha generation, you could be making a killing. If you're good, you should be, uh, let's say, long the good names and short the bad names. And as a good long short portfolio manager, you should be making a killing. But I think, and it's not coming from me, if you, if you listen to the specialist of the passive investments, is passive in investment plus options have been completely destroying this market. Because in other words, the passive investment, the ETF of this world, are always buying those th same names that are getting bigger and bigger. So that's making the, the alpha generation completely di distorted. Uh, and if you use on top of that some weekly options, uh, that is a recipe for um, disaster. Fed expectations, um, a bit of Fed. We always need to do a bit of Fed. Last time we did one was a month ago. So here, this is for the Euro dollar. Um, so on the top, this is on the 4th of November, so almost a month ago. Uh, so two things to be looking at the as of, as of yesterday is what is the market now pricing? So if you take 99.80 for December, what's going to happen in June? you're going to have probably 25 bips rate hike. 
Then if you take in September, maybe almost another one, and then in December, another one. So roughly for next year, you could have two to three 25 beefs rate hike. Uh, in other words, um, and if you look at what happened versus uh, a month ago, so if you look at December 2022, um, we have been uh, coming down. So now the market participants and based on what the Fed has been saying, the Fed has been saying now that guess what? The inflation is not transitory. Oh, what a big news. I mean, we did a, a webinar in, in May of this year and we knew already that it was not transitory. That doesn't mean that uh, we are smarter. That just means that at the central bankers, you can't say in May or June that it's not going to be uh, transitory because otherwise the, that, that is a big mess and you need to be tapering much quicker than expected. So um, the Fed, the central banks have been uh, uh, divided between uh, 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 running uh, the economies and in the meantime, not running the economies too hot. The thing is, um, as we've been saying over and over, we know that they were running a hot potato. Um, and hot potato with my funny English accent means that you see inflation and the inflation is way above the 2%. And now what they are telling us is, you know, we can be betting on three to 4% for next year. So now everyone knows that we're going to have inflation. So when, go, when you see headlines about, oh, inflation, inflation, as a market participant, we all know that there is inflation. It's in the market. Everyone knows it. If it's in the newspaper, if you talk about it, if politicians are talking about it, it's priced in. Okay. So actually now for the Fed, a lot is priced in. For the ECB, a lot is priced in. Um, what is key now is can they deliver on the growth? And because we're probably going to see uh, inflation come uh, coming down and a bit, uh, at least with oil and, and some other factors uh, year on year uh, potentially coming down. So Fed expectation, in other words, inflation is not transitory anymore. Uh, so uh, you got to have and you have the flattening of the yield curve. So uh, let me jump back into uh, this one. Uh, if I can do US 10 years minus US 2 year, that would be the one. Okay, so that's the 10 versus the two. Uh, you can do as well the 30 versus the 10 or the 30 versus the 20. Uh, so this is the, the, the yield curve, okay? Uh, so we had um, last year some uh, uh, steepening of the yield curve, which was positive for the banks, positive for everyone, because we were expecting inflation, because we were expecting uh, the world to, to be doing pretty well. What you have now is we know that the different central banks and the, the, the Fed tries to control the long part of the, the curve, okay? So 10 years and something. So they try as much as possible and staying around 140, 150, but they know that there is inflation. So the short part of the curve, they need to raise rates because there's gonna be inflation. They need to do something and they can't leave everything at, at 0%. So, in other words, now, in three sessions, we went from 1% uh, differential to 80 bips, so 20 bips in three days. So that, that is a really, really big move. Uh, if you think about the um, implications, normally this is not really good for banks, okay? Because that means that they're gonna be making less money. Uh, but that tells you that as well, that I think now, inflation expectations are not moving higher anymore, okay? So inflation expectation, and if you look at something at the five years, five years break even that we discussed uh, some time ago, that was in May. So go back into the other webinars or ask me the question um, with, in emails. Um, we know that inflation expectations are not coming down. So don't be scared about the headlines. Um, uh, you should be, uh, we know that there is inflation, um, but um, it's coming down a bit, but it tells you as well that the gross expectations that probably we had a three or six months ago, it's gone. So the economies, the, the, the all economies, GDP growth are not going to be stellar. Okay. So you get the flattening of the yield curve, you get yields, literally everything coming down a bit uh, because the world is not going to be going that much. And 
and still you're gonna have some inflation. Okay, I hope it makes a bit of sense. Maybe, maybe not. Um, next slide. Uh, so this is um, the uh, euro dollar curve. Uh, looking at the different colors, so orange will be as of yesterday, um, in green uh, a week ago, and in blue that was a month ago. So you can see orange and blue is more or less the same. The only difference you can see it's going a bit up here. Okay, so it's going a bit up. So why is it so? Because we there's going to be less growth than expected. So the Fed is not going to be as aggressive as we think. Uh, later on, but um, actually in, in, in 2022 now, it feels pretty much like the Fed will have to do two to three times uh, rate hike um, uh, during this, this 12 months period. So PMIs, a bit of uh, PMIs, always a bit of PMI, start of the month. So uh, this is the chart of uh, US in gray, China in yellow, Eurozone in blue, Japan in green, uh, global in purple, and EM in red. So what you can see, uh, there is a kind of stabilization uh, at pretty high level, but there is no acceleration. Uh, the global PMI, the JP Morgan one, and we are talking manufacturing is at 54.2 versus 54.3 in October. So pretty much the same picture as it was last month. Uh, Japan is picking up a bit, but there is a lot of volatility there uh, due to COVID. Uh, if we jump into the ISM manufacturing, uh, so the, the headline was 61.1, more or less the same as the 60.8% that we had last month. The new orders were a bit higher. Prices are still very high uh, at 82.4. So very still a very high level. Uh, again, we know that inflation, instead of being transitory, is there at least for another three to six months, uh, that is for sure. Um, but overall, the, the headline numbers are, pre are pretty much okay. Okay, they are okay, they are more than okay because 60% means the, uh, you should have, you know, 3% uh, GDP growth. But if you scroll down into the sectors, um, into the, the sectors that are growing and the sectors that are not growing. So if you take the headline number here, yeah, and if you take the new orders, because I think those are the two most important uh, um, um, data in the uh, in this in this report. I mean, there are prices as well, depending where you are in the cycle. But uh, what, is, what is interesting is the sectors that are reporting a decrease and the sector that are reporting growth, as you can see from one month to another, the numbers are coming down. So, and there has been between October and November quite an acceleration on the sector reporting growth. So that went from 16% sectors growing in October to 13% in November. And if you look at the new orders, which is really the leading indicator of the leading indicator, the picture is a bit worse. So you have sectors reporting decrease, you get five in terms of, in, instead of two and reporting growth 10 instead of 14. So what is happening is before that, and we knew, and I've been saying that over and over since September, October, we know that we were peaking, okay? So you are peaking in terms of growth here. Everything is peaking, uh, it's, it's the top. That means now uh, uh, you have less sectors that are growing um, and, um, out of this, um, so it's not like the whole economy. So when you have a V-shaped recovery, everything is bouncing, everything. Now, it's not everything that is bouncing and it is now showing in the, in, in the, in the sector's uh, report, uh, which is actually good news in terms of ID generation because you're gonna start to identify some sectors based on NAI's uh, uh, um, uh, screening uh, or stocks um, that um, way you could be generating alpha. So. Why I want to say that is because the headline number is a bit misleading uh, and is not telling you the real pictures that inside this, uh, uh, this macro picture, um, uh, that you have less sectors that are growing uh, now. So a bit of oil market. So sorry, I'm jumping from one to another, but I try to cover as much as possible. So oil market. So here I'm using exactly the same slides that I used in September. So in September, I came to you with a call that we were getting close to 
uh, the old time high on oil and oil was WTI was trading between 82 and 85. And at that time, you know, people were saying, oh, no, yeah, no, it's not going to happen. You know, Greg is wrong. It's going to go to 100. Okay. And, and the, the overall, um, I look, I'm not an oil specialist and I trade literally oil every six, 12 months. Uh, I don't trade you know, every week. Um, I trade in 2016, January, 2016. Uh, I traded last year when it was around the twenties. I traded uh, this year as well. So I try, maybe I'm lucky, but I will be trading uh, very often the, the, um, the extreme. So here we get the, the chart of the world oil demand year on year versus the world GDP growth. We know that the oil demand and the, uh, the oil demand before the crisis was around 100 million barrels. And it's extremely correlated with the GDP growth. So meaning for oil to grow, you need obviously the GDP to grow. In September, October, we were ex expectations were pretty much bullish on, on 2022 GDP growth world for the world. We know now that the world is not reopening the way uh, it was supposed, or it might have happened, let's say three months ago, that things are slowing, that Asia is still very slow, China is still pretty much close, closed, uh, that uh, with the, the variant, a lot of uh, uh, um, growth is out of the picture. So that means the oil demand, don't expect you know oil demand to be back, I think, uh, to uh, 2019 level. So you had some headlines two weeks ago that it was back to 2019 levels. I don't think that is. Um, so if you jump into the next slide, um, and here you can be using data. So all those data are for free, okay? So you don't need a Reuters, you don't need a Bloomberg, you don't need to have connection. You, you don't need to pretend to be this guy on CNBC knowing everything about oil. You just need to go on the Energy Information Administration, the EIA, and taking exactly the same as what I did is looking at every month, the supply and demand. So here, this is what we're gonna be mostly looking at. So uh, you get the, the, the total world supply and the total world consumption. And here, this is the supply, uh, the surplus and the deficit. So in, in March last year, we had a massive surplus. Okay, we are talking 20 million barrels. Okay, literally, we went from 100 million barrel consumptions to 80 million barrel consumption because the world stopped by 20% almost overnight. Okay, so that was literally, this is why the oil contract for this month of March, or that was April, went negative because no one could, could store somewhere this oil. Then, you know, OPEC rightly so said, you know, we are not gonna be producing tons of oil and we need to reduce production. So they massively reduced production. We are talking Saudis and we are talking the Russian and the overall OPEC. So they reduced they reduce production massively, which ended up having a deficit. So you have a deficit plus in the meantime, the world is slowly reopening, meaning the demand is picking up. So still you get OPEC smart enough to uh, 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 try to deal with the existing uh, stocks, uh, 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 meaning uh, uh, reducing this number of, of, of barrels that were sitting across the world and in tankers. And as well, you know, making sure that uh, uh, um, uh, production is not too big. But as we've been saying, we knew from September, October, that what was coming in Q1, Q2 was surplus, surplus of production. So there was a mismatch, meaning there was more oil produced than oil um, um, consumed. So you had many factors. You had the seasonality. If you look at the chart of oil, you can go on Twitter. There are many guys who will be doing it. Um, if you look over the last 20 years, November and December for the oil price uh, action is pretty, pretty bad. Plus we knew that in Q1, you get too much oil coming. So when you had the headlines of people telling you it's going to 100, 150, it might go to 100, 150 because, um, um, because of, we know we try to reduce exposure to oil. 
because in developed market there is a call to go for renewables that um, as well there is um, a lot of under investment so if you're not putting capex to produce oil that means in two three four five years down the line um, there's not going to be enough oil and you still get emerging markets and developed markets that are using oil massively but that will be later short term you knew that oil was going to be oversupplied so suddenly a month ago uh, opec was saying no no we're fine <laughs> we're fine we're going to be putting 400,000 barrels more every month because you know actually uh, there is a lot of demand there is not that much demand the world is not that strong Consum consumption is not that strong china is not that strong uh, so gdp growth is not that strong so and now they are telling us, oh, actually, it's an open conversation and we could change at any point in time the decision of uh, up, upping the production for 400,000 barrels. So now I think my view is you're back to the OPEC put, which in other words, if, it's comes, if oil goes down into the low 60s, uh, they will reduce production again. Okay, so they have the beauty... I think for the OPEC over the last 12 months is they have seen that when they work together, uh, they can have a real impact on oil. This is something that they haven't done for quite a, quite a long time. And as long as you are above 60, uh, I think there is an agreement. Uh, you don't want oil to go down uh, too quickly um, because otherwise you're going to see players that uh, just want to do whatever they want. But um, literally... I strongly advise you to spend, uh, if you're trading oil, spend two hours. You don't need that much, to, more than that, you know, to look at the supply and demand and when it, what is happening in the market uh, in the next few months. So this is the picture, supply, surplus, deficit. Again, so this is uh, the overall picture. This is, so we are in November. So this is roughly where we are. And we knew that that was the surplus coming. Uh, so no rocket science, um, oil at 85 was clearly a short. I hope you did it. Uh, last week, um, last Friday and this week was, was a very good trade. Um, it's all about supply and, uh, and demand. Okay, uh, so that's the same chart I'm using, uh, just copy and paste for the ones uh, six weeks ago. So um, look at the, if you are watching tonight or if you're watching on the YouTube, on YouTube, you can be looking back at this, um, at this um, webinar that we did six weeks ago uh, on oil and shorting oil. Quickly on education. So this is um, something that I mentioned the couple of weeks ago. Um, if you are interested in the four by four trading course, um, I'm doing a uh, 25% holiday discount until the end of this uh, month, uh, December now. So 25%, so you're going to be saving roughly $500 or, dollars or a bit more. Uh, so with the 4 by 4 this is what I do in terms of education. I do three things. I do the 4 by 4 video series, so a very comprehensive investment process. You're going to have... Uh, I think it's like 40 plus videos, 50 Excel spreadsheets, like 30 hours of footage, uh, the whole process, macro, ID generation, uh, fundamental uh, options, FX, risk management. Uh, so tons of things to learn uh, based on my 20 years experience, long only, long short, uh, doing mentor uh, for another company. Uh, many people coming to me and say, look, I'm struggling with with their investment process, it doesn't work. Uh, should I be doing the screening on P? And they realize that, you know, it's not about P. Uh, P is really uh, the last part of the process. Uh, trading community, so trying to push the trading community. I'm active every day. Uh, people are coming slowly but surely. Uh, I push the oil IDs, I push the S&P short, I push K and D. Um, I'm always... Uh, you know, there on the community to try to help people um, on the different uh, steps in the learning curve, something that I really enjoy. Um, I hope and I wish that we're going to be more active together and we're going to be uh, make it growing. And the third part of the process is the mentoring. So if you do the mentoring or the four by four, you'll get access to the community. 
So the mentoring is uh, 12 sessions, one-on-one, -on -one, uh, Zoom or Skype, um, where we learn together uh, to manage your portfolio. So you, uh, you will open um, a brokerage account, putting your own money, and we're going to be doing different steps of, of the investment process. The first step is the quantitative analysis. So it's really building the numbers, putting your infrastructure. Then we do the qualitative analysis. And then we do similar to today, technical analysis, price action, and we spend a lot of time on risk management. Uh, we're going to be doing across asset classes. We're going to be using options. These days, I have many people coming to me and say, look, Greg, uh, do you do um, um, mentoring only with options? Uh, because I want to be making 50 to 100% because apparently uh, some, invest, some um, educators are selling those kind of returns. I think this is foolish if you come and tell people you're going to be making 50 to 100% plus you know, that comes with a downside, which is um, if you make 50 to 100%, you can be losing 25 to 50%. So in other words, the risk reward is three to one or two to one. So don't be fooled by this uh, 500%. I know that marketing wise, people like it, especially in these days of options, but this is a very risky game. So uh, those are the three steps of and where I think I can help you and I help. And in the meantime, I'm benefiting a lot from you because the community, you get ideas and mentoring is the same. You bring ideas, we share ideas. Um, so I like it. Okay, this is it for today. Um, if you have any questions, so today is, is a one hour call, so pretty long call. Uh, if you get questions from today, uh, either for, for the people who joined or if you are on YouTube later, please send me an email. Um, I might be able to help you. Um, and uh, going forward again, we get two weeks before the big expiry NFP tomorrow. Um, kind of binary market. So uh, the only thing that I will always say, because I've, 15 years ago, I did the mistake is always be liquid in your market as much as possible. If there is a real sell-off, uh, the, the illiquid names will be absolutely murdered. You can see from this market with the Russell 2000, uh, as well from the dodgy names, that the, the less liquid names or the less quality names, um, when the market is done by one, they will be, uh, be done by two or three. And, and the beta that is based on recent uh, uh, correlation actually goes down the toilet. So be extremely careful. We had uh, a, a lot of calculation on the beta uh, that are done on, on 6, 12, 18 months. And it's not necessarily taking into account uh, uh, the changes in volatility and correlation. But that's something that I cover in the mentoring and in the four by four. Thank you for joining. I hope to see you soon. I will do the last one in a couple of weeks. Uh, until then, have a good time and be safe in the market. All the best. Thank you for joining. Bye-bye.